Uh, I'd like to now call upon our uh, main speaker for the day who's been patiently listening to everyone else. Uh, Dr. Jean Dacuna is Senior Policy Advisor with UN Women at the headquarters in New York. She was formerly the Regional Director of UNIFEM, which is the United Nations Development Fund for Women uh, for the East and Southeast Asia Zone at Bangkok. She's a widely published author and is also an advisor to several governments on the issue of uh, violence against women. Uh, she was also a resident of uh, Mumbai and taught at the St. Xavier's College for uh, a decade. Amongst all the talk about violence against women, um, we are very privileged to have her because we are slowly beginning to realize that it's not a city problem, it's not a state problem, it's not even a national problem. But an, but an international problem. Uh, she's going to throw light on uh, violence against women as an international issue and the trends that she's seen and the work of UN Women. Dr. Dakuna. I want to thank the ORF for inviting me to make this presentation here today on preventing sexual crimes against women from a gender equality and a women's human rights perspective, which is also promoted by the UN system, including UN Women, which is the organization to which I belong. Now, before I go any further, I would like to say a few words on UN Women. Well, we are the latest UN organization established as we were in 2010 as a result of a merger of four UN entities or four organizations in the UN system that were previously doing work on gender, and this is part of UN reform. Our mission and mandate is to promote gender equality and women's human rights in global, regional, national agendas, and in the work of the UN system. And we have four areas of work, women, peace, and security, ending violence against women, promoting women's economic empowerment and gender responsive governance and promoting women's political leadership. So having said that now, I wish to divide this presentation very briefly into two sections. The first will highlight the key markers and trends on sexual violence globally and highlight or assess briefly the mainstream discourse and practice on the issue. And the second will deal with certain preventive strategies and actions, drawing on the good practice of governments, civil society organizations, and the UN in support of national priorities worldwide. So to begin with, number one, sexual violence is one of the most pervasive, universal, international human rights violations against women, which occurs globally. And we have data to suggest that six out of 10 women worldwide experience physical and or sexual violence in a lifetime. We have data from the World Bank, 1994 data to suggest that women between the ages 16 and 44 die or are disabled firstly from sexual violence or domestic violence, and they've actually listed a whole list of risk factors wherein this ranks first and outstrips cancer or deaths from malaria, war, accidents, and the like. So you see how pervasive it is. Secondly, there are context-specific manifestations of sexual violence against women. For example, female genital mutilation. And women's experience of sexual violence is very much mediated by a whole host of interacting factors, such as their economic status, race, ethnicity, nationality status, immigrant status, sexual orientation, and the like. We also have context-specific research to suggest that certain groups of women, such as indigenous women, minority women, refugee women, and others, are more vulnerable to sexual violence. And we have studies, for instance, in Australia, a 2003 study, which suggests that indigenous women in Australia are 28 times more likely to be admitted into hospital with serious injuries. Thirdly, having said that, I want to reiterate and emphasize that sexual violence against women really transcends class barriers, it transcends race, nationality, ethnicity, there are no barriers with respect to marital status, there are no barriers with respect to age. 
And we do have documented evidence which suggests that babies as young as two months have been raped and violated, and old women as old as 90 years of age have been raped. And if there's any new evidence, I stand corrected, if there's any new evidence to suggest that anyone younger or older has been violated and raped. And this is shocking. We also know that fully clad women are raped in full public view, in fact, gang raped in public spaces. We know that sexual violence, that rape occurs in public spaces and in the privacy of domesticity. We know that rape and sexual violence is perpetrated by state actors as well as non-state actors, including family members, friends, acquaintances, and not just strangers. And we also know that sexual violence is perpetrated against women in normal times, but very much in conflict situations as well. And all of this only goes to show that sexual histories of women or women's mobility in the public space, or women's equal interactions with men, or women's dress codes, or women's uh, unhindered um, uh, you know, um, activity in the public space, I just said that, really is not the real cause for sexual violence or rape against them. The fourth issue that I want to raise is that sexual violence and um, crimes against sexual offenses are variously categorized, so you may have sexual harassment, you may have more grievous forms of sexual assault like rape, but I want to also call attention to a third form, sexual crimes against women in the name of tradition and culture. For instance, as I mentioned earlier, female genital mutilation. And a fourth category, which are not explicit sexual crimes, but are heinous crimes against women which are directly or indirectly related to the sexual management of women. And an example of this is honor killing or penalties for adultery, which are also justified in the name of tradition, in the name of male honor, in the name of religion. So the fifth point that I want to make is that these are not random acts of violence. They have a very strong systemic and structural basis. They are rooted in interacting socio-economic political processes. They are based or grounded in gender role and trait stereotypes, which are discriminatory and unequal gender relations that privilege males. And this is very well entrenched in our cultural systems, in our norms, in our cultural practices. This is very well institutionalized in our legal systems and our political structures. This is very much at the heart of our formal ideologies. This is very much at the heart of our public discourses. And this is very much anchored in our local economies, in our global economies. And all of this, as we know, is underpinned by class, by ethnic, by nationality stereotypes, marginalization, and the rest. The last point that I want to make, I, I want to also say one thing, that when we're talking about male privilege, this privilege and authority is often exercised through a whole range of means. One is the exploitation of women's productive work and reproductive work. The second is the control of women's sexuality and reproductive capacity. The third is through our cultural norms and practices. And the fourth is through violence against women and sexual violence against women who are constructed are as either Madonnas or whores or property, including the sexual property of men in marriage, or as objects and commodities who are functional to male hegemony and to male fantasy. And this violence reinforces male authority. It reinforces traditional role stereotypes. It assuages masculine threats or perceptions of threat to masculinity through its punitive, through its controlling functions. And if this happens in peacetime, it happens so much more in conflict situations. And we do know from conflicts around the world 
that rape is increasingly being used, sexual violence against women is increasingly used as a systematic tactic of conflict and warfare to attain military objectives, to achieve political objectives. And we have data on mass rapes, and we know them, 250,000 to 500,000 women ra raped in Rwanda in 1994. Masses of women raped in Bangladesh in 1971. 20,000 to 50,000 women raped in Bosnia in the early 90s. Rape, as we know, is used as an instrument of torture to inflict injury, to degrade women, to humiliate the opponent, to extract information, to intimidate women. Willfully, rape is used to spread HIV AIDS, to decimate populations, to ward off populations from their lands and appropriate resources. We have documented evidence of all of this. We have documented evidence of forced abortions on women in conflict situations, forced sterilization, rape and forcible impregnation of women, all as means of ethnic cleansing. We have data from uh, uh, conflict contexts wherein Kosovo Albanian women were constructed as sexually promiscuous. And so you have this panic among the Serbians. And so you have ethnic cleansing against these women as a political strategy, as an ethnically, you know, a, a, a strategy that is used to ethnically cleanse these women. So you also have instances of sexual slavery. We have documented evidence of women being abducted and forced to serve as wives to militants, to combatants who have proved themselves in battle. So this is what we are up against. And the last point that I want to make in terms of markers and trends is that sexual violence against women cannot be seen in isolation. It has to be linked to other forms of violence against women, domestic violence and other forms of violence. It has to be linked to other forms of rights violation and forms of marginalization against women. And it has to be linked to larger social and political processes for example, processes such as an unregulated market model of development to conflict situations and other such processes. So this is one side of the picture. But at another level, what we have been seeing is the emergence of a human rights framework and a human rights regime around gender equality, women's rights, gender-based violence, sexual violence, and the like. And this is really due to the tireless struggle of women's rights advocates who have interacted with international organizations, including the UN system. And all of this really dates back, insofar as women are concerned, to the decade for women. That's 75, 85, the women's decade. And it also encompasses various international conferences on women the Mexico Conference, the Copenhagen Conference, the Nairobi Conference, the Beijing Conference, and their forward-looking strategies and outcome documents. Further, the human rights regime does manifest itself in conventions that have been um, uh, ratified, you know, adopted by various governments and negotiated by various governments, governments within the UN system. And we have four, uh, seven core conventions. Uh, the one that deals specifically with women is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, that is CEDAW. This human rights regime at a global level also manifests itself in monitoring mechanisms, such as the various committees that have been set up aligned with these conventions to actually engage in constructive dialogue with governments and to monitor governments compliance and adherence to human rights standards that they have committed to. The human rights regime also manifests itself in the special procedure system. We have what are called special rapporteurs, um, either country-based rapporteurs or thematic rapporteurs, such as the special rapporteur on violence against women, who go to countries and investigate the field reality and make recommendations to government to take uh, correctional uh, measures on the issue. 
this regime also manifests itself in a whole range of General Assembly resolutions and Security Council resolutions. And you may be aware that there are three Security Council resolutions which deal with sexual violence against women. And finally, we have a whole range of regional human rights instruments and mechanisms to deal with violence against women, not to mention uh, the international criminal justice system that also addresses issues of violence against women. Now, having said that, what is the normative significance of this regime? And I want to deal here with CEDAW very, very briefly. We have about 187 governments worldwide that have ratified the CEDAW Convention. It is a very unique convention because it solely deals with women's human rights. And this is really important in a context where the mainstream human rights discourse and practice tends to marginalize women's human rights. Secondly, CEDAW has about 16 substantive articles which deal with rights violations against women in the sphere of the economy, polity, and in the social cultural sphere. And it also addresses public sphere violations, as well as violations in the private space of domesticity. Thirdly, it has a very comprehensive definition of non-discrimination, which addresses both direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. Fourthly, it talks not just about uh, formal equality between men and women, but also substantive equality, real access to results and benefits through changes in institutional norms and procedures, through the introduction of special temporary measures and the like, to uh, you know, address this whole cumulative disadvantage that women have faced. Fifthly, it removes the focus on individual retribution, or retribution for individuals to address systems and ideologies. Sixthly, it looks at human rights as indivisible, all rights are interdependent. It transcends the divide between economic and political rights and civil, uh, civil and political rights and economic and social rights. Further, the article in CEDAW, which addresses elimination of discriminatory cultural attitudes, and the article on non-discrimination, give it the widest possible application, rendering it applicable to any situation of discrimination against women worldwide. And lastly, you have a very comprehensive definition of state obligation, which obligates not just states, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, or, or, or makes them accountable not just for state actors who violate women, but states are also accountable to holding to account um, and bringing to justice non-state actors who have violated women. And lastly, I want to say that the human rights regime looks at women as shapers of their own destiny and not as passive recipients um, you know, of welfare. The second point that I want to make is the, about the Vienna Conference, which def uh, actually defined women's human rights or women's rights as human rights, gender-based violence as a, a, a rights violation against women. The Beijing Platform for Action and Declaration which talked not just about gender equality, but also women's empowerment as twin and related strategies. A very important uh, and significant contribution made by the Beijing Platform for Action was to say that gender equality and women's empowerment was necessary for peace and sustainable human development. And lastly, I talked about the Security Council resolutions that have actually addressed violence against women in conflict situations as a human security issue. And I want to conclude with this campaign of the Secretary General, um, which has tried to garner polit or, uh, you know, political commitment at the highest levels to address violence against women. And he's tried to tie it to development, the Millennium Development Goals. Now, violence against women has not been addressed in the MDGs, but we are trying, you know, at various levels to see that it is a critical part of the post-2015 development agenda. Very briefly, you know, what, has, uh, what have these norms uh, in terms of operational significance, okay? You have these standards, but what is happening at national levels? And I want to say that there, is, there have been a whole plethora of national action plans, 
legislation on violence against women. 89 countries, and this is 2006 data, so it's a bit dated, but 89 countries on domestic violence legislation. About 90 countries with sexual harassment, some form of legislation on sexual harassment. 104 countries addressing marital rape about 93 countries with some form of legislation on trafficking. So that is at the level of policy and legislation. We also have here in India excellent examples of frontline service provision for women who have been violated. Hotlines, one-stop service center, data, research, and the like. But despite this, we are seeing a big gap between policy and between practice. And if we look at the mainstream popular public discourse on sexual violence against women, it definitely lacks a human rights and rights-based development orientation. It's very much, you know, to do with an assertion of class, male, ethnic, nationality, and other forms of power against women or over women. The second point that I want to make is that with the progressive realization of women's rights, we are seeing a continuing tension between cultural relativism and universalism um, at different levels. And we see this played out so often in the debates at country level and also, you know, um, at the UN. The third thing is, you know, we are seeing a, a spread of religious fundamentalisms and a politicization of culture by religious fundamentalists. And in the context of progressive realization of women's rights, you see women's beings and women's bodies be becoming the site of contest and violation. The fourth point that I want to make is that we must locate or should locate violence against women, including sexual violence against women, within this larger culture of an unregulated market model of development deregulation of labor standards, exploitation of labor, uh, absolutely plundering the environment, pillaging, vandalism. So there's a general culture of violence, and there's a culture of violence also against women. We've be become totally desensitized. And together with this, you have a rising culture of impunity, you know, including against gender-based violence and sexual violence. And this increases the use and the consequences of violence against women as a punitive, in terms of its punitive, in terms of its controlling functions. At the operational level, in terms of strategies, what we are seeing by way of gaps is that for very long, we've largely, and this is happening across the world, we've been addressing, you know, the post-violation um, uh, situation of women. So there's a very strong focus on post-violation assistance. But we really need a very big paradigm shift towards preventive strategies. That's primary prevention as well as secondary prevention strategies, number one. Number two, violence, sexual violence against women is multi-layered. It has legal dimensions, health dimensions, uh, economic dimensions, and therefore we need coordinated multi-sectoral response. Thirdly, what I want to say is that large-scale transformation needs a whole-of-sector approach. It cannot be just our national women's machineries. The whole of government has to think and act on gender equality and women's rights, sexual violence, gender-based violence. When we're talking of civil society, it can't just be women's organizations. Women's organizations have to have critical linkages with other segments of civil society, and civil society needs to be critically linked with the government sector and with institutional, um, um, uh, international organizations as well. Large-scale transformation also requires an upscaling of our pilots. And very often, we do these small little pilots, you know, that die a natural death. So we need to mainstream or ensure that the, the provisions for upscaling are built into the design of our pilots. Also, for sustainability, we need institutionalization. We need to change institutional norms and cultures we need to institutionalize our capacity building activities and we need resources allocated for this for long-term sustainability. 
And lastly, we need greater accountability. There is a crisis of accountability. And this accountability has to do with respect to answerability for non-performance and corrective action, which must be taken both against state and non-state actors. And you know, we are very, uh, always very keen to hold governments to account. True, we need to hold governments and state actors to account, but I think we also need to hold one another to account. You know, uh, So that's the point that I want to make. So where do we go from here and what do we do? There are two small points I want to make. I think we need, uh, I mean, I don't think there's any um, disagreement with this. We need to act because it's a human rights issue. But we also need to act because there are costs, okay? And I'm making here the efficiency argument. There are costs to women, human costs, and economic costs, health costs. Uh, women lose out on wages when they are absent, when they are sexually violated or violated in any other form. Then there are intergenerational impacts. Children who witness violence might become perpetrators of violence and we are creating unstable societies. There are societal, huge societal costs at the level of economics. We have the United States of America that spends $5.4 billion on costs for medical services, you know, legal services, and things like that, and loses, in, in terms of productivity losses, $1.8 billion annually. So for all these reasons, we need to act. And we need, now I have been told to speak about preventive strategies, and so I want to focus on primary prevention, that is preventive strategies before violence has occurred, as well as secondary prevention, that is violence may have occurred, but you act, to damage control or control the damage and prevent further violation. So these are the strategies and this is very much based on action that has been taken by various actors in various parts of the globe. So firstly, we do need good data, quality data, comparable data. Uh, we do need data that is, you know, collected um, regularly so that we can see what changes are happening over time. We do have some good examples of data collection, specific surveys on VOW, that is violence against women, which are conducted in Canada, unfortunately mostly in developed countries because of resources, Sweden, Finland, USA, Australia, and the like. But we also have good, some data with respect to questionnaires and modules and questions which are inserted into demographic surveys or reproductive health surveys or health surveys in several developing countries, India, uh, Haiti, uh, Cambodia, and the like. So there is a possibility of doing that. And this data helps us to formulate better policies and programs. Secondly, we need to mainstream violence against women issues and sexual violence into national development strategies and into sectoral plans, policies with targets, indicators and resources allocated. And we need to expend those resources and track how those resources are actually implemented or used, you know, and what difference this has made to women on the ground. Thirdly, we need specific legislation. And we have, I just mentioned, several examples of legislation that we already have. Fourthly, we need to monitor the implementation of this legislation through mechanisms like the Ombudsperson or our gender equality machinery or national rapporteurs or through observatories and the like. And we have good examples of this. For instance, in Cambodia and the Netherlands, they have national rapporteurs to monitor their trafficking legislation. We need to periodically review our legislation so that we make change and policies and programs so that we can make appropriate changes. And we have good examples from various countries where Canada, for instance, has reviewed its legislation and now the onus for, for proving you know, or establishing that rape occurred is placed completely on men. And there are other examples as well. With, then you need a whole set of preventive strategies to deal with, uh, 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 that deal with information, education, public awareness raising. And I want to give some good examples. For instance, in Nepal, uh, you know, the government of Nepal banned women from migrating. 
because they saw that as a safeguard against trafficking. And this happened for many years. And there was, you know, a lot of media hype about migrant women being trafficked and a stigma against them when they returned because they were seen to be tarnished. So UN Women at that point started working in Nepal. And we worked very strongly with the media, all media forms, the radio, the television, the print media. There was a media, so there was a sensitization program, several of them. And then there was this media blitzkrieg over three months, you know, very simple messages of eliminating the ban, introducing protective provisions for women through law and programs, you know, and highlighting the contribution that women migrant workers make to development, both in countries of employment and in the country of origin, that is Nepal. And lo and behold, within three months, the government made public pronouncements about introducing legislation, and in 2008, we do have legislation which protects migrant workers, including women migrant workers in Nepal. So consciousness raising also on the issue of sexual violence and other forms of gender-based violence. Secondly, community mobilization. And here I want to give you the example of in Upper Egypt. Um, NGOs have worked, and we've supported them, to work with uh, religious leaders and community leaders to stop female genital mutilation. So villages have actually developed contracts wherein parents will not mutilate or, uh, uh, you know, engage in this. Men will marry women who have not been mutilated. And uh, the midwives will not do this anymore in alternative forms of income generation for them because if they don't get an income, that would happen underhand. Yeah. Thirdly, working with men and boys. And this is extremely important. We need a new set. We need to work with newer partners, like religious leaders, men and boys, who must be seen as a solution to the problem uh, and not as constantly seen as the problem, although there is a problem, OK? And it's very important to engage in debunking or working, uh, working on male stereotypes, you know, that impinge on men and that have neg negative consequences on men. Because I feel if you don't um, address that, you're going to have this imbalance and you're never going to have men and women building alliances. You know, and I see that as a very uh, good way of, mm, I wouldn't like to use getting male buy-in, but of helping men to understand you know, the stereotypes which impinge upon them and you know, lead to the violation of women. The White Ribbon Campaign was uh, set up in Canada in 1991. It operates in about 47 countries. And they do fantastic work working with men and boys. They have training programs, public awareness raising, men um, you know, engaged in childcare and fathering. They have peer educators among men. Uh, they've actually documented some of the work that they've done and, and tracked. They've done some longitudinal studies and also seen a reduction um, uh, you know, in, in HIV uh, transmission in certain areas because of, you know, protected sex, not violating women and the like. So this is the White Ribbon Campaign. Uh, we also need to mainstream uh, violence against women and sexual violence against women into our planning, our urban planning, our rural planning, our transport system. And today I was talking to Akshara and, you know, I was so impressed with the whole, the, the work that um, Akshara is doing um, with buses, the BEST, and with conductors and preventing sexual violence in buses and protocols that must govern, you know, the BEST staff. And I was saying we need not disincentives for them to change the culture. We also need incentives as, uh, you know, um, standing operating procedures um, within that setup. Um, we also need to build women's capacity and we need to continue to do that very strongly when talking about working with men and boys we must not divert the scarce resources that we have to do work with women. So build women's capacity to say no to violence against women. And then we have a third set of measures uh, that deal with the, the justice system and security sector reform. And here we really need to speed up investigation procedures. We need to have comprehensive evidence um, uh, uh, th that is not tampered with. We need to have our records and our complaints, which are you know, well documented. And we need women to actually be interviewed by, and we know that that law exists, but we must see that it's not violated, interviewed by skilled and professional women police officers. Okay? And we have this provision in many countries in the world. 
We also need to have gender-sensitive court systems and rules of evidence. And we have good examples, for instance, the Philippines, Finland, Ireland, Nepal. They have um, in-camera trials. They restrict public access. Um, you have um, confidentiality of the victim. And we have that here as well. Uh, in Jordan and Tunisia, they have done away with virginity testing. Okay? And in other countries like Ethiopia, Costa Rica, Egypt, they have eliminated immunity for perpetrators who marry women. You know? So you rape the woman, then you marry her, then nothing is done. So they've eliminated that provision altogether. Okay? Then convictions and prosecutions. We really also need to have our sentencing matched with the severity of the crime. And we need to monitor what kinds of sentences are given. And for instance, in the UK, the Solicitor General monitors the kinds of sentences that are given for sexual violence. And if they are too lenient, these cases are sent to a, higher, to a criminal court of appeal, so to speak. We need special courts, and there are debates about that. But they lead to speedy implementation, you know, and they lead to prosecutions. We have in South Africa about 54 special courts for sexual offenses against women. So these are some of the reforms that we need. And finally, we need strong accountability mechanisms. And on that note, I'd like to stop talking and close here. Thank you very much. Evening. Yeah. The first thing is, what incites men to violence, aggression, assault? What goes on in their mind? What is their behavior? What is the workings of the mind of the man? Now we should have training modules, programs, CDs, DVDs, 12 to 16, 17 to 21, 22 to 27 years, cells, centers, groups, chapters, toll helplines, emails, contact centers, website, portals for women. We should not distinguish, differentiate between boys and girls, household work, cleaning, sweeping, wiping, so that they will not fool on the roads and waste their energy there. Sensitize men, involve, engage men, two hours discussion. Every day, in every area, locality, chawl, baiti chawl, slum, and all that, have a TV and radio channel 24 hours for women where they can highlight their issues and know what is right and wrong. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ratan Lal. Uh, your uh, lecture was very wide. You have covered almost every country. You have covered almost everything that is good, that goes between the sexuality and everything else. But one thing I noticed that you have not covered Japan. And in Japan, the ladies are subservient. They only serve when they are not married. After the marriage, they are located in the house. And, uh, and uh, I mean, they carry out everything, even by some... Uh, uh, sixth sense also, they follow their husbands and then this thing. And you have not covered at all the Japan which you consider as uh, one of the... So I think, uh, would you please say something about Japan? We'll take uh, one or two more remarks and then possibly she can. Uh, I would like to acknowledge one more luminaire of the women's right movement over here, Chaya Datar. And uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, you might have learned about this uh, new law which is coming, which is called sexual, sexual assault bill. And there is a very peculiar thing about that is that it is a gender neutrality which has been introduced there. And which many of us have feel, you know, it's a quite a wrong thing to do. Uh, so I wonder whether any other country in the world, you know, I mean they have introduced that with the intention, I suppose, uh, that 377 could be abolished, you know, so that uh, 377 takes care of this, uh, you know, the man-to-man, -man, uh, 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 yeah, the man-to-man -man, uh, kind of uh, violence, etc. But, I mean, there, I mean, there could be, uh, uh, I mean, the perpetrator has to be a man, you know, so the man can perpetrate uh, to uh, a man, also to women, but women cannot do sexual you know attack to men so i suppose this is a gender neutrality of both types you know the perpetrators as well as the 
victims, which seems to be quite strange to us and we have been arguing about it. So did you come across this kind of phenomenon in any other country? One more? Okay. worked and one was done. These statistics are all available on the internet. Women can also harm men sexually. These things are there. People have died of it also. Whatever the details are, those who are interested, the internet is full of it. So could you tell us why prevention has worked? What do we need to do as a society, as a person, as a whoever? Thank you. Okay, so with respect to Japan, yes, Japan is a very patriarchal society and we know from early days it also had practices like binding which was actually a, a mechanism of sexual management of women because it enhanced women's sexuality, it prevented their mobility and it constrained them. But we also have a lot of violence against women. For instance, there was a WHO um, study that was done in several countries, including Japan, and the prevalence in Japan, the, the prevalence was seen, the, the range was about 30 to 60 percent, 15 percent in Japan. So yes, I agree with you, it's quite a patriarchal society. Uh, with respect to Chaya's question, you know, the thing about gender neutrality, if you look at trafficking legislation, there's a lot of uh, laws across the world that are now not just saying trafficking in women and children. They're talking about trafficking in persons, okay? So because they're accepting that men, women, boys, and girls are trafficked. Uh, with respect, we, in fact, we were having a discussion today with several friends about uh, the gender neutrality here. And... You know, to some extent, it's important for us to recognize that there is violence, sexual violence against boys and men as well. So to that extent, if it's being, um, if you're addressing the victim uh, of sexual violence, it's fine. But the perpetrator of sexual violence, it's a very masculine kind of act if you're talking about rape, okay? Uh, and then I raised the question, I said, you know, if you're talking about rape, and you have an expanded definition of rape where you're looking at insertion of objects into any orifice. I mean, that could also be done by a woman, you know. Uh, but I think the thinking was that doesn't happen mainstream and, you know, as a big trend and you would be diverting the issue. So in terms of the perpetrator, you still need to pin it to men. So I think that was the thinking um, behind it, yeah. Um, with respect to uh, prevention, to be very honest with you, I think the point that we've just been making is that for too long we've been looking at post-violation um, interventions. And we really need, there are two things that are critical, you know, and um, prevention has occurred at small, um, in small communities, you know, at a small scale, but you shift the problem somewhere else then. Because these things need to be upscaled in a massive way. And there are two or three things that we haven't done so well over the years. Number one, uh, and this happens with any sectoral movement, uh, the women's movement, I believe, has focused only on women, which has been good at a certain level, but men have been left out, boys have been left out of that equation for a very long time. And I think now there is a shift to addressing men and boys. So these are part of very critical prevention strategies, uh, you know, which unless you, um, you, you, you sort of act on them big scale, you know, you're not going to see prevention happening so easily on a large scale. The second thing that we need to do um, uh, is, uh, yeah, men and boys and, um, uh, you know, the whole range that I've talked about. But the only thing I can say to you is, yes, there are examples of prevention at small community-based, um, you know, uh, levels. But we're still battling with the big, you know, picture. Because you have to start it at the level of school. You have to start it in families. You have to start training, you know, um, youth for the long haul. So I'm very sorry, but we don't have big prevention that has worked. We're still battling with the issues all over the world, and we have it in small communities. Yes, the example that I gave you of HIV AIDS, that particular community that was surveyed, you know, yes, they did increase violence there, but it has to be done across the board. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Ma'am. Uh, just to clarify, there is one problem 
which the law makers have you see everybody says you should make a very strict law for anybody who violates women but i know some cases as that lady just spoke that a woman wants to frame a man she wants to put him in trouble and i know one particular case where a woman said i tore my own clothes and i went to the police station and complained that he raped me so anything is possible so what give, please i would like to have your comments on this what can be done in such a case you see it takes a lot for any woman to stand up and say she was sexually violated raped or sexually harassed and to go through that legal grind to file a complaint to go to court to be cross examined in court is is a very pulverizing experience so i don't think very many women are going to stand up and frame charges and frame men wrongly you know because it takes a lot okay and women go through a lot so i would if it's one or two experiences you know that's that's the exception of course it's yes of course i mean there's forensic you know evidence and all kinds of circumstantial evidence and all that can be taken into account uh yeah sorry i just have one quick question so jean uh, in terms of the subject of your talk and the timing of it now everyone knows that there's sort of a, a bit of social momentum in india on women's rights especially on violence against women with the delhi rape case and one of the things that i think people have seen in the protests at least in the media coverage is that uh, there are a lot of youth protesting and young people so what links do you think the women's movement can make with this kind of new generation of young people in india and worldwide to harness the youth and child rights movement uh, to address violence against women and girls and men and boys yes you know i was very and i think we have ngos that have begun to do really good work with schools and with colleges you know so as part of the curriculum or extra curricular activity raising awareness dealing with male stereotypes and uh, female stereotypes links i think we need to make links with youth organizations um uh, you know community based youth organizations religious based youth organizations so that link has to be made with child rights groups so i agree with you very much and i think that is beginning to happen in a big way you do know that uh, there's also a huge campaign that unesco and you know uh, they've unleashed the campaign on education now part of that campaign has to do with education for global citizenship and we have youth parliaments we have a whole lot of ngos youth ngos worldwide that are part of that whole endeavor so i think the women's movement has to make strong build strong alliances there and cannot just be having this little incestuous relationship with itself you know ma'am one one second uh ma'am i have got a suggestion to make basically sir what have feel in about 20 25 years back i was traveling in a remote madhya pradesh i have observed certain tribes out there wherein those tribes are so like you know they are women centric rather than men centric like you know the men have to pay a dowry to get married you know like how, what i mean to say is how like you know we need to study those tribes actually i don't know whether tri those tribes have been studied actually or not but those tribes we need to study those tribes how have they managed to be so progressive though being tribals and uneducated like that's a suggestion that we need to do things so. See, I'm sure many of the people here know this, but there are plenty, plenty of practical suggestions. They don't always work. One is if you're going home late. This is a very upper middle class issue. You have to have money to go home in a cab or safely. For everyone, it's not possible. Let's just take that as said. You have to make sure you look at people on the road, stare them in the face, see what they are up to. Most rapes are committed by people you know, so make sure is there something odd. If you have a young cousin, male or female, who has who is showing adult characteristics. is there somebody making mocking remarks about him or her you need to stop that 
If you're going to come home late, do two people know about it? A lot of men don't understand this, that what's the big deal about dropping somebody home? If they don't, then you have to take care. The time for depending on other people is long, long gone. They have not been able to do anything. If somebody attacks you, can you throw your wallet down and run? They may want the wallet more than you. So these are various small things. They don't always work, but there's a whole, whole list of suggestions. And if people can add to that, we can possibly teach other people about it. Will they work always? No. Will they work at least once? Probably. So that's what I was looking for. Can you have shoes in which you can run? If you're going to wear those shoes which wrap around the ankle, that's not a very good thing if you're going to come home late drunk from a bar. So that kind of thing. If you are drinking, you have to make sure you have a proper ride home. And drinking and smoking has normally been done by the lower middle. It's not a painted and dented issue at all. Uh, I mean, these are the things. And a lot of men in India seem to have hatred of women who are well-dressed. I've not seen this anywhere else. Maybe your uh, uh, experiences are different. Yeah, hi, sorry, just quite quickly, Jean, I, I wanted to say, just building on the comments that, you know, were just said, advice to women, what do you think of this reaction that happens in terms of addressing rape and violence against women, where the focus is on preventing it for yourself? So as a young woman, being given advice not to dress a certain way, don't get drunk, don't go clubbing, don't go to bars, because I think that a lot of the youth protests that have been happening by young women and men have been specifically against this kind of attitude and a focus on a wider structural level of prevention of violence and legislative changes and accountability for perpetrators and creating a culture that is anti-violence against women rather than be careful. And these are all practical tips that I think are very helpful in the short term. But what do you think of this? Uh, what are some of the long-term solutions that are needed in a country like India? Is that women must have the right to live a life free of violence. And I must have the right to be able to walk on a road at 10 o'clock in the night or 6 o'clock in the morning without being torn and violated, just as a man can. I must have the right to be able to interact with men, you know, in a professional way or, you know, in a friendly way without being seen as a loose character. I must be able to dress and you know, I want to also say something about dress codes, okay? There's also, now maybe you'll see me as a bit conservative, but I also think, you know, you shouldn't be objectifying yourself or commodifying yourself. So, you know, you can dress with spaghetti straps and all of that and whatever, but there need to be appropriate dress codes for different situations. But that still does not give women, men, the right to violate you, okay? Now, I was very sure, for instance, prostitution, okay, just because a woman is in prostitution, that does not give any man the right to say that she will consent to that sexual act with him, okay, because she has the right to say no to every sexual act, she has the right to say no to men, and I was shocked that even in, in the United States of America, I mean, not that there's any rape, uh, whatever, <laughs> they said a whore, the judge says, a whore is a whore is a whore, she can never be raped. So I think that kind of freedom should be given to women. And this is, it's not for lack of sexual alternatives. It is an assertion of power over women, you know. And that needs to be addressed. So the focus has to be on the computer. I think another thing, thing which requires security is that no policeman will ever rape a person under the police should decide. Direct action as well. I think that's it. Any more questions? For this, I guess women's act is not more a function. For this, I guess women's act yes. uh, in the US is not in function right now. There's a lot of snag going to be about the authorization and the authorization. There is some discussion about changes in that act, but let me say that I am quite impressed by the act. <laughs> because it's quite comprehensive. It also addresses immigrant women, and it's one of the few acts in the world, together with Spain and a few other countries, that, uh, that actually address different categories of women. So prevention, protection, prostitution, and immigrant women who go on spousal, you know what they call dependent visas, they have a dependent status, they go as uh, dependents or fiancés or spouses or whatever, partners, etc. 
they have to prove it's a valid marriage and they have to prove that they've lived for a certain amount of time well married. And if there's abuse against them, they don't report it because they are fearful of being deported, you know. But they get waivers. So there's something called the battered wife's waiver and they can independently get permanent residence and citizenship if they can prove violation. And it doesn't take much to prove a violation. The women's uh, woman's statement or an affidavit, you know, or some relative or friend talking on our behalf is also enough. Okay, thank you. I'd like to invite Mr. Kulkarni for the concluding remarks. Thank you, Dean. Wonderful. Friends, let's show our appreciation for uh, <clears throat> a very sensitive very comprehensive and of course inspirational talk. You readily agreed to come here and give a talk at very short notice. And by doing so, we have, you've done us honor, Observer Research Foundation and honor. Thank you very much. Friends, we are all in the midst of a movement. And this talk was also a part of the movement. A movement triggered by a horrendous crime, but uh, in dying, this 23-year-old girl, she has, I think, done historic service to social justice, social reform. The awareness that has been generated through protests, through various kinds of mass actions has been absolutely unprecedented. We at the Observer Research Foundation felt that it is our social responsibility to be part of this movement. As my colleague Radha mentioned at the beginning, you know, we are, uh, we've taken up women's issues, uh, you know, for quite some time, but uh, in the past one month, our commitment has risen to a very high level and we want to keep this, not just keep it but raise it even higher in partnership with other organizations and we are very, very happy that uh, we have found a partner in uh, municipal corporations, Savitri Bai Phule Gender Resource Center. An idea that came out of a round table has now galvanized us into so many activities, all of which centered around one slogan. You know, in the resolution that we adopted at the round table, we said, you know, we appealed to the Prime Minister. This was before the end of the year. It was an opportunity for the government to say 2013 would be observed as a year to make India safe for women and children everywhere 24 by 7. But instead of waiting for uh, the central government to act or the state government to act, we decided that we should be part of a people's movement to, in, since we are in Mumbai, why don't we give a call and be part of a movement, a campaign to make Mumbai safe for women and children 24 by 7. We are very happy friends 
that uh, this campaign itself is part of a much, much larger, indeed a global campaign, a high point of which is soon, up, soon approaching. It is February 14, 1 billion rising. You mentioned, Gene, right at the beginning, that 60 percent, it may be a conservative figure, but 60 percent of women in their lifetime are in some way or the other violated. It's a huge, huge number. We don't acknowledge it. But this movement has opened the eyes of people all over the world. And suddenly, it has also gained momentum in India. But this is not just a global mo movement. It's not just a national movement. It has to be a local movement. Global, national, local, and even micro. So we want to be part of this movement, movement and uh, thank you very much for uh, giving a UN perspective, a global perspective. But since you have been an activist, you are not just an academic, you have been an activist that has really, uh, you know, inspired us to act with greater commitment. And we, sh we certainly will do so in the, in the time to come. And uh, we hope to be in conversation with you in future too. Friends, one last point. We men, boys, are part of the problem, but we are also part of the solution. Without us, this movement cannot succeed because we are the cause of the problem. So enormous sensitization at all levels has to take place. It's not an easy task at all. You know, there was a question about preventive. You know, we cannot see the success of any preventive strategy, preventive action on a mega scale anywhere in the world. It has to be small preventive action sustained. I don't know how long it's going to take, but Suddenly, our society has, has woken up. It's a good opportunity, and we must not lose the momentum. So finally, as a, as a token of ORF's appreciation, this is our present view. We must also acknowledge here the presence of my very good friend, Lloyd. Please come here. Come on. In Lloyd Ego, he's also part of uh, the movement. We've had the pleasure of uh, listening to him here. He is an international expert on disaster management. We're going to be here for the whole of January at home. So please come again and uh, give a talk. Thank you very much.